Chapter Eight of the History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter Eight Progress of the Quarrel, 1202. Temujin's stratagem succeeded admirably. As soon as he had decided upon it, he began to put it into execution. He caused every thing of value to be taken out of his tent and carried away to a place of safety. He sent away the women and children, too, to the same place. He then marshaled all his men, excepting the small guard that he was going to leave behind until evening, and led them off to the ambuscade which he had chosen for them. The place was about two leagues distant from his camp. Temujin concealed himself here in a narrow dell among the mountains, not far from the road where Vang Khan would have to pass along. The dell was narrow and was protected by precipitous rocks on each side. There was a wood at the entrance to it also, which concealed those that were hidden in it from view, and a brook which flowed by near the entrance, so that, in going in or coming out, it was necessary to ford the brook. Temujin, on arriving at the spot, went with all his troops into the dell and concealed himself there. In the meantime, the guard that had been left behind in the camp had been instructed to kindle up the campfires as soon as the evening came on, according to the usual custom, and to set lights in the tents, so as to give the camp the appearance, when seen from a little distance in the night, of being occupied as usual by the army. They were to wait, and watch the fires and lights, until they perceived signs of the approach of the enemy to attack the camp, when they were secretly to retire on the farther side, and so make their escape. These preparations, and the march of Temujin's troops to the place of ambuscade, occupied almost the whole of the day, and it was near evening before the last of the troops had entered the dell. They had scarce accomplished this maneuver before Vang Khan's army arrived. Vang Khan himself was not with them. He had entrusted the expedition to the command of Sankam and Yamuka. Indeed, it is probable that they were the real originators and contrivers of it, and that Vang Khan had only been induced to give his consent to it, and that, perhaps reluctantly, by their persuasions. Sankam and Yamuka advanced cautiously at the head of their columns, and when they saw the illumination of the camp produced by the lights and the campfires, they thought at once that all was right, and that their old enemy and rival was now, at last, within their reach and at their mercy. They brought up the men as near to the camp as they could come without being observed, and then, drawing their bows and making their arrows ready, they advanced furiously to the onset and discharged an immense shower of arrows in among the tents. They expected to see thousands of men come rushing out from the tents, or starting up from the ground, at this sudden assault, but to their utter astonishment all was silent and motionless after the falling of the arrows as before. They then discharged more arrows, and finding that they could not awaken any signs of life, they began to advance cautiously and enter the camp. They found, of course, that it had been entirely evacuated. They then rode round and round the enclosure, examining the ground with flambeaux and torches to find the tracks which Temujin's army had made in going away. The tracks were soon discovered. Those who first saw them immediately set off in pursuit of the fugitives, as they supposed them, shouting at the same time for the rest to follow. Some did follow immediately. Others, who had strayed away to greater or less distances on either side of the camp in search of the tracks, 
fell in by degrees as they received the order, while others still remained among the tents, where they were to be seen riding to and fro, endeavoring to make discoveries, or gathering together in groups to express to one another their astonishment, or to inquire what was next to be done. They, however, all gradually fell into the ranks of those who were following the track which had been found, and the whole body went on as fast as they could go, and in great confusion. They all supposed that Temujin and his troops were making a precipitate retreat, and were expecting every moment to come up to him in his rear, in which case he would be taken at great disadvantage, and would be easily overwhelmed. Instead of this, Temujin was just coming forward from his hiding-place, with his squadrons all in perfect order, and advancing in a firm, steady, and compact column, all being ready at the word of command to charge in good order, but with terrible impetuosity upon the advancing enemy. In this way the two armies came together. The shock of the encounter was terrific. Temujin, as might have been expected, was completely victorious. The confused masses of Vang Khan's army were overborne, thrown into dreadful confusion, and trampled underfoot. Great numbers were killed. Those that escaped, being killed at once, turned and fled. Sankum was wounded in the face by an arrow, but he still was able to keep his seat upon his horse, and so galloped away. Those that succeeded in saving themselves got back as soon as they could into the road by which they came, and so made their way in detached and open parties home to Karakoram. Of course, after this, Vang Khan could no longer dissimulate his hostility to Temujin, and both parties prepared for open war. The different historians through whom we derive our information in respect to the life and adventures of Genghis Khan have related the transactions which occurred after this open outbreak between Temujin and Vang Khan somewhat differently. Combining their accounts, we learn that both parties, after the battle, opened negotiations with such neighboring tribes as they supposed likely to take sides in the conflict, each endeavoring to gain as many adherents as possible to his own cause. Temujin obtained the alliance and cooperation of a great number of Tartar princes who ruled over hordes that dwelt in that part of the country, or among the mountains around. Some of these chieftains were his relatives. Others were induced to join him by being convinced that he would, in the end, prove to be stronger than Vang Khan, and being in some sense politicians as well as warriors, they wished to be sure of coming out at the close of the contest on the victorious side. There was a certain Khan named Turkili, who was a relative of Temujin, and who commanded a very powerful tribe. On approaching the confines of his territory, Temujin, not being certain of Turkili's disposition toward him, sent forward an ambassador to announce his approach, and to ask if Turkili still retained the friendship which had long subsisted between them. Turkili might, perhaps, have hesitated which side to join, but the presence of Temujin with his whole troop upon his frontier seems to have determined him, so he sent a favorable answer, and at once espoused Temujin's cause. Many other chieftains joined Temujin in much the same way, and thus the forces under his command were constantly increased. At length, in his progress across the country, he came with his troop of followers to a place where there was a stream of salt or bitter water which was unfit to drink. Temujin encamped on the shores of this stream and performed a grand ceremony in which he himself and his allies banded themselves together in the most solemn manner. In the course of the ceremony, a horse was sacrificed on the shores of the stream. Temujin also took up some of the water from the brook and drank it, invoking heaven at the same time to witness a solemn vow which he made, 
that as long as he lived he would share with his officers and soldiers the bitter as well as the sweet and imprecating curses upon himself if he should ever violate his oath all his allies and officers did the same after him this ceremony was long remembered in the army all those who had been present and had taken part in it cherishing the recollection of it with pride and pleasure and long afterward when temujin had attained to the height of his power and glory his generals considered their having been present at this first solemn league and covenant as conferring upon them a sort of title of nobility by which they and their descendants were to be distinguished forever above all those whose adhesion to the cause of the conqueror dated from a later time by this time temujin began to feel quite strong he moved on with his army till he came to the borders of a lake which was not a great way from vang khan's dominions here he encamped and before proceeding any farther he determined to try the effect upon the mind of vang khan of a letter of expostulation and remonstrance so he wrote to him substantially as follows a great many years ago in the time of my father when you were driven from your throne by your enemies my father came to your aid defeated your enemies and restored you at a later time after i had come into your dominions your brother conspired against you with the marcats and the naamans i defeated them and helped you to recover your power when you were reduced to great distress i shared with you my flocks and everything that i had at another time when you were in circumstances of great danger and distress you sent to me to ask that my four intrepids might go and rescue you i sent them according to your request and they delivered you from a most imminent danger they helped you to conquer your enemies and to recover an immense booty from them in many other instances when the khans have combined against you i have given you most effectual aid in subduing them how is it then after receiving all these benefits from me for a period of so many years that you form plans to destroy me in so base and treacherous a manner this letter seems to have produced some impression upon vang khan's mind but he was now it seems so much under the influence of sankum and yemuka that he could decide nothing for himself he sent the letter to sankum to ask him what answer should be returned but sankum in addition to his former feelings of envy and jealousy against temujin was now irritated and angry in consequence of the wound that he had received and determined to have his revenge he would not hear of any accommodation in the meantime the khans of all the tartar and mongol tribes that lived in the countries bordering on vang khan's dominions hearing of the rupture between vang khan and temujin and aware of the great struggle for the mastery between those two potentates that was about to take place became more and more interested in the quarrel temujin was very active in opening negotiations with them and in endeavoring to induce them to take his side he was a comparatively young and rising man while vang khan was becoming advanced in years and was now almost wholly under the influence of sankum and yamuka temujin moreover had already acquired great fame and great popularity as a commander and his reputation was increasing every day while vang khan's glory was evidently on the wan a great number of the khans were of course predisposed to take temujin's side others he compelled to join him by force and others he persuaded by promising to release them from the exactions and the tyranny which vang khan had exercised over them and declaring that he was a messenger especially sent from heaven to accomplish their deliverance those asiatic tribes were always ready to believe in military messengers sent from heaven to make conquests for their benefit among other nations who joined temujin at this time 
were the people of his own country of mongolistan proper he was received very joyfully by his stepfather who was in command there and by all his former subjects and they all promised to sustain him in the coming war after a time when temujin had by these and similar means greatly increased the number of his adherents and proportionately strengthened his position he sent an ambassador again to vang khan to propose some accommodation vang khan called a council to consider the proposal but sankum and yemuka persisted in refusing to allow any accommodation to be made they declared that they would not listen to proposals of peace on any other condition than that of the absolute surrender of temujin and of all who were confederate with him to vang khan as their lawful sovereign sankum himself delivered the message to the ambassador tell the rebel mongols he said that they are to expect no peace but by submitting absolutely to the khan's will and as for temujin i will never see him again till i come to him sword in hand to kill him immediately after this sankum and yemuka sent off some small plundering expeditions into the mongol country but they were driven back by temujin's troops without effecting their purpose the result of these skirmishes was however greatly to exasperate both parties and to lead them to prepare in earnest for open war end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of the History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. The Death of Vang Khan, twelve hundred o two. The Grand Council was now called of all the confederates who were leagued with temujin at a place called mankarul to make arrangements for a vigorous prosecution of the war at this council were convened all the chieftains and khans that had been induced to declare against vang khan each one came attended by a considerable body of troops as his escort and a grand deliberation was held some were in favor of trying once more to come to some terms of accommodation with vang khan but temujin convinced them that there was nothing to be hoped for except on condition of absolute submission and that in that case vang khan would never be content until he had effected the utter ruin of every one who had been engaged in the rebellion so it was at last decided that every man should return to his own tribe and there raise as large a force as he could with a view to carrying on the war with the utmost vigor temujin was formally appointed general-in-chief of the army to be raised there was a sort of truncheon or ornamented club called the topaz which it was customary on such occasions to bestow with great solemnity on the general thus chosen as his badge of command the topaz was in this instance conferred upon temujin with all the usual ceremonies he accepted it on the express condition that every man would punctually and implicitly obey all his orders and that he should have absolute power to punish any one who should disobey him in the way that he judged best and that they should submit without question to all his decisions to these conditions they all solemnly agreed being thus regularly placed in command temujin began by giving places of honor and authority to those who left vang khan's service to follow him he took this occasion to remember and reward the two slaves who had come to him in the night at his camp some time before to give him warning of the design of sankum and yemuka to come and surprise him there he gave the slaves their freedom and made provision for their maintenance as long as they should live he also put them on the list of exempts the exempts were a class of persons upon whom 
as a reward for great public services were conferred certain exclusive rights and privileges they had no taxes to pay in case of plunder taken from the enemy they received their full share without any deduction while all the others were obliged to contribute a portion of their shares for the khan the exempts too were allowed various other privileges they had the right to go into the presence of the khan at any time without waiting as others were obliged to do till they obtained permission and what was more singular still they were entitled to nine pardons for any offenses that they might commit so that it was only when they had committed ten misdemeanors or crimes that they were in danger of punishment the privileges which temujin thus bestowed upon the slaves were to be continued to their descendants to the seventh generation temujin rewarded the slaves in this bountiful manner partly no doubt out of sincere gratitude to them for having been the means probably of saving him and his army from destruction and partly for effect in order to impress upon his followers a strong conviction that any great services rendered to him or to his cause were certain to be well rewarded temujin now found himself at the head of a very large body of men and his first care was to establish a settled system of discipline among them so that they could act with regularity and order when coming into battle he divided his army into three separate bodies the center was composed of his own guards and was commanded by himself the wings were formed of the squadrons of his confederates and allies his plan in coming into battle was to send forward the two wings retaining the center as a reserve and hold them prepared to rush in with irresistible power whenever the time should arrive at which their coming would produce the greatest effect when everything was thus arranged temujin set his army in motion and began to advance toward the country of vang khan the squadrons which composed his immense horde were so numerous that they covered all the plain in the meantime vang khan had not been idle he or rather sankum and yemuka acting in his name had assembled a great army and he had set out on his march from karakorum to meet his enemy his forces however though more numerous were by no means so well disciplined and arranged as those of temujin they were greatly encumbered too with baggage the army being followed in its march by endless trains of wagons conveying provisions arms and military stores of all kinds its progress was therefore necessarily slow for the troops of horsemen were obliged to regulate their speed by the movement of the wagons which on account of the heavy burdens that they contained and the want of finished roads was necessarily slow the two armies met upon a plain between two rivers and a most desperate and bloody battle ensued karasher temujin's former tutor led one of the divisions of temujin's army and was opposed by yemuka who headed the wing of vang khan's army which confronted his division the other wings attacked each other too in the most furious manner and for three hours it was doubtful which party would be successful at length temujin who had all this time remained in the background with his reserve saw that the favorable moment had arrived for him to intervene and he gave the order for his guards to charge which they did with such impetuosity as to carry all before them one after another of vang khan's squadrons was overpowered thrown into confusion and driven from the field it was not long before vang khan saw that all was lost he gave up the contest and fled a small troop of horsemen consisting of his immediate attendants and guards went with him at first the fugitives took the road toward karakorum they were however so hotly pursued that they were obliged to turn off in another direction and finally vang khan resolved to fly from his own country altogether 
and appeal for protection to a certain chieftain named Tayin Khan, who ruled over a great horde called the Naimans, one of the most powerful tribes in the country of Karakate. This Tayin was the father of Temujin's first wife, the young princess to whom he was married during the lifetime of his father, when he was only about fourteen years old. It was thought strange that Vang Khan should thus seek refuge among the Naimans, for he had not, for some time past, been on friendly terms either with Tayin the Khan or with the tribe. There were, in particular, a considerable number of the subordinate chieftains who cherished a deep-seated resentment against him for injuries which he had inflicted upon them and upon their country in former wars. But all these Tartar tribes entertained very high ideas of the obligations of hospitality, and Vang Khan thought that when the Naimans saw him coming among them, a fugitive and in distress, they would lay aside their animosity and give him a kind reception. Indeed, Tayin himself, on whom, as the head of the tribe, the chief discredit would attach of any evil befalling a visitor and a guest who had come in his distress to seek hospitality, was inclined at first to receive his enemy kindly and to offer him a refuge. He debated the matter with the other chieftains after Vang Khan had entered his dominions and was approaching his camp. But they were extremely unwilling that any mercy should be shown to their fallen enemy. They represented to Tayian how great an enemy he had always been to them. They exaggerated the injuries which he had done them, and represented them in their worst light. They said, moreover, that by harboring Vang Khan they should only involve themselves in a war with Temujin, who would undoubtedly follow his enemy into their country and would greatly resent any attempt on their part to protect him. These considerations had great effect on the mind of Tayin, but still he could not bring himself to give his formal consent to any act of hostility against Vang Khan. So the other chieftains held a council among themselves to consider what they should do. They resolved to take upon themselves the responsibility of slaying Vang Khan. We cannot induce Tayian openly to authorize it, they said, but he secretly desires it, and he will be glad when it is done. Tayian knew very well what course things were taking, though he pretended not to know, and so allowed the other chiefs to go on in their own way. They accordingly fitted out a troop, and two of the chieftains, the two who felt the most bitter and determined hatred against Vang Khan, placing themselves at the head of it, set off to intercept him. He had lingered on the way, it seems, after entering the Naaman territory, in order to learn, before he advanced too far, what reception he was likely to meet with. The troop of Naamans came suddenly upon him in his encampment, slew all his attendants, and seizing Vang Khan, they cut off his head. They left the body where it lay, and carried off the head to show it to Tayian. Tayian was secretly pleased, and he could not quite conceal the gratification which the death of his old enemy afforded him. He even addressed the head in words of scorn and spite, which revealed the exultation that he felt at the downfall of his rival. Then, however, checking himself, he blamed the chieftains for killing him. Considering his venerable age, said he, and his past greatness and renown as a prince and commander, you would have done much better to have acted as his guards than as his executioners. Tayian ordered the head to be treated with the utmost respect. After properly preparing it, by some process of drying and preserving, he caused it to be enclosed in a case of silver and set in a place of honor. While the preparations for this sort of entombment were making, the head was an object of a very solemn and mysterious interest for all the horde. They said that the tongue thrust itself several times out of the mouth, and the soothsayers, 
who watched the changes with great attention, drew from them important presages in respect to the coming events of the war. These presages were strongly in favor of the increasing prosperity and power of Temujin. Sankum, the son of Vang Khan, was killed in the battle, but Yamuka escaped. End of chapter 9《ジェンギス・カーン》This is a This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 10 The Death of Yamuka, 1202 to 1203. In the meantime, while these events had been occurring in the country of the Naimans, whither Vang Khan had fled, Temujin was carrying all before him in the country of Vang Khan. His victory in the battle was complete, and it must have been a very great battle if any reliance is to be placed on the accounts given of the number slain, which it was said amounted to forty thousand. These numbers are, however, greatly exaggerated. And then, besides, the number slain in such barbarian conflicts was always much greater in proportion to the numbers engaged than it is in the better regulated warfare of civilized nations in modern times. At all events, Temujin gained a very grand and decisive victory. He took a great many prisoners and a great deal of plunder. All those trains of wagons fell into his hands, and the contents of many of them were extremely valuable. He took also a great number of horses. Most of these were horses that had belonged to the men who were killed, or who had been made prisoners. All the best troops that remained of Vang Khan's army after the battle also went over to his side. They considered that Vang Khan's power was now entirely overthrown, and that, thenceforth, Temujin would be the acknowledged ruler of the whole country. They were, accordingly, ready at once to transfer their allegiance to him. Very soon Temujin received the news of Vang Khan's death from his father-in-law, Taiyan, and then proceeded with more vigor than before to take possession of all his dominions. The Khans, who had formerly served under Vang Khan, sent in their adhesion to him one after another. They not only knew that all farther resistance would be useless, but they were, in fact, well pleased to transfer their allegiance to their old friend and favorite. Temujin made a sort of triumphal march through the country, being received everywhere with rejoicings and acclamations of welcome. His old enemies, Sankum and Yamuka, had disappeared. Yamuka, who had been, after all, the leading spirit in the opposition to Temujin, still held a body of armed men together, consisting of all the troops that he had been able to rally after the battle, but it was not known exactly where he had gone. The other relatives and friends of Vang Khan went over to Temujin's side without any delay. Indeed, they vied with each other to see who should most recommend themselves to his favor. A brother of Vang Khan, who was an influential and powerful chieftain, came among the rest to tender his services, and, by way of a present, to conciliate Temujin's goodwill, he brought him his daughter, whom he offered to Temujin as an addition to the number of his wives. Temujin received the brother very kindly, he accepted the present which he brought him of his daughter, but as he had already plenty of wives, and as one of his principal officers, the captain of his guards, seemed to take a special fancy to her, he very generously, as was thought, passed over the young lady to him. Of course, the young lady herself had nothing to say in the case. She was obliged to acquiesce submissively in any arrangement which her father and the other khans thought proper to make in respect to the disposal of her. The name of the prince, her father, was Hakambu. 
he came into temujin's camp with many misgivings fearing that as he was a brother of vang khan temujin might feel a special resentment against him and perhaps refuse to accept his submission and his proffered presence when therefore he found how kindly he was received his mind was greatly relieved and he asked temujin to appoint him to some command in his army temujin replied that he would do it with great pleasure and the more readily because it was the brother of vang khan who asked it indeed he said to hakambu i owe you all the kind treatment in my power for your brother's sake in return for the succor and protection for which i was indebted to him in my misfortunes in former times when he received me a fugitive and an exile at his court and bestowed upon me so many favors i have never forgotten and never shall forget the great obligations i am under to him and although in later years he turned against me still i have never blamed either him or his son sankum for this but have constantly attributed it to the false representations and evil influence of yemuka who has always been my implacable enemy i do not therefore feel any resentment against vang khan for having thus turned against me nor do i any the less respect his memory on that account and i am very glad that an opportunity now occurs for me to make through you his brother some small acknowledgment of the debt of gratitude which i owe him so temujin gave hakambu an honorable post in his army and treated him in all respects with great consideration if he acted usually in this generous manner it is not at all surprising that he acquired that boundless influence over the minds of his followers which aided him so essentially in attaining his subsequent greatness and renown in the meantime although sankum was killed yamuka had succeeded in making his escape and after meeting with various adventures he finally reached the country of Tayen. he led with him there all that portion of vang khan's army that had saved themselves from being killed or made prisoners and also a great number of officers these broken troops yamuka had reorganized as well as he could by collecting the scattered remnants and rearranging the broken squadrons and in this manner accompanied by such of the sick and wounded as were able to ride had arrived in tayen's dominions he was known to be a general of great abilities and he was very favorably received in tayen's court indeed tayen having heard rumors of the rapid manner in which temujin was extending his conquests and his power began to be somewhat jealous of him and to think that it was time for him to take measures to prevent this aggrandizement of his son-in-law from going too far of course tayen held a great many conversations with yamaka in respect to temujin's character and schemes these yamaka took care to represent in the most unfavorable light in order to increase as much as possible tayen's feelings of suspicion and jealousy he represented temujin as a very ambitious man full of schemes for his own aggrandizement and without any sentiments of gratitude or of honor to restrain him in the execution of them he threw wholly upon him the responsibility of the war with vang khan it grew he said out of plots which temujin had formed to destroy both vang khan and his son notwithstanding the great obligations he had been under to them for their kindness to him in his misfortunes yamuka urged tayen also to arouse himself before it was too late to guard himself from the danger he is your son it is true said he and he professes to be your friend but he is so treacherous and unprincipled that you can place no reliance upon him whatever and notwithstanding all your past kindness to him and the tie of relationship which ought to bind him to you he will as readily form plans to compass your destruction as he would that of any other man the moment he imagines that you stand in the way of the accomplishment 
of his ambitious schemes these representations acting upon taian's natural apprehensions and fears produced a very sensible effect and at length taian was induced to take some measures for defending himself from the threatened danger so he opened negotiations with the khans of various tribes which he thought likely to join him and soon formed quite a powerful league of the enemies of temujin and of all who were willing to join in an attempt to restrict his power these steps were all taken with great secrecy for yemaka and taian were very desirous that temujin should know nothing of the league which they were forming against him until their arrangements were fully matured and they were ready for action they did not however succeed in keeping the secret as long as they intended they were generally careful not to propose to any khan or chieftain to join them in their league until they had first fully ascertained that he was favorable to the object of it but growing less cautious as they went on they at last made a mistake Tayin sent proposals to a certain prince or khan named Alicus, inviting him to join the league these proposals were contained in a letter which was sent by a special messenger the letter specified all the particulars of the league with a statement of the plans which the allies were intending to pursue and an enumeration of the principal khans or tribes that were already engaged now it happened that this Alicus, who reigned over a nation of numerous and powerful tribes on the confines of china was for some reason or other inclined to take temujin's side in the quarrel so he detained the messenger who brought the letter as a prisoner and sent the letter itself containing all the particulars of the conspiracy at once to temujin temujin was greatly surprised at receiving the intelligence for up to that moment he had considered his father-in-law taian as one of his best and most trustworthy friends he immediately called a grand council of war to consider what was to be done temujin had a son named juki who had now grown up to be a young man juki's father thought it was now time for his son to begin to take his place and act his part among the other princes and chieftains of his court and he accordingly gave him a seat at this council and thus publicly recognized him for the first time as one of the chief personages of the state the council after hearing a statement of the case in respect to the league which taian and the others were forming were strongly inclined to combine their forces and march at once to attack the enemy before their plans should be more fully matured but there was a difficulty in respect to horses the horses of the different hordes that belonged to temujin's army had become so much exhausted by the long marches and other fatigues that they had undergone in the late campaigns that they would not be in a fit condition to commence a new expedition until they had had some time to rest and recruit but a certain khan named bule an uncle of temujin's at once removed this objection by offering to furnish a full supply of fresh horses for the whole army from his own herds this circumstance shows on what an immense scale the pastoral occupations of the great asiatic chieftains were conducted in those days temujin accepted this offer on the part of his uncle and preparations were immediately made for the marching of the expedition as soon as the news of these preparations reached yemuka he urged taian to assemble the allied troops immediately and go out to meet temujin and his army before they should cross the frontier it is better said he addressing taian that you should meet and fight him on his own ground rather than to wait until he has crossed the frontier and commenced his ravages in yours no said taian in reply it is better to wait the farther he advances on his march the more his horses and his men will be spent with fatigue the scantier will be their supplies and the more difficult will he find it to effect his retreat after we shall have gained a victory over him in battle so taian though he began to assemble his forces did not advance and when temujin 
at the head of his host, reached the Naaman frontier, for the country over which Tayian reigned was called the country of the Naamans. He was surprised to find no enemy there to defend it. He was the more surprised at this from the circumstance that the frontier, being formed by a river, might have been very easily defended. But when he arrived at the bank of the river the way was clear. He immediately crossed the stream with all his forces, and then marched on into the Naaman territory. Temujin took good care, as he advanced, to guard against the danger into which Tayian had predicted that he would fall, that of exhausting the strength of his men and of his animals, and also his stores of food. He took good care to provide and to take with him abundant supplies, and also to advance so carefully and by such easy stages as to keep both the men and the horses fresh and in full strength all the way. In this order and condition he at last arrived at the spot where Tayian had formed his camp and assembled his armies. Both sides immediately marshaled their troops in order of battle. Yamaka was chief in command on Tayian's side. He was assisted by a young prince, the son of Tayian, whose name was Kushluk. On the other hand, Juki, the young son of Temujin, who had been brought forward at the council, was appointed to a very prominent position on his father's side. Indeed, these two young princes, who were animated by an intense feeling of rivalry and emulation toward each other, were appointed to lead the van on their respective sides in commencing the battle. Juki, advancing first to the attack, and being met by Kushluk, to whom was committed the charge of repelling him. The two princes fought throughout the battle with the utmost bravery, and both of them acquired great renown. The battle was commenced early in the morning and continued all day. In the end, Temujin was completely victorious. Tayian was mortally wounded early in the day. He was immediately taken off the field, and every possible effort was made to save his life, but he soon ceased to breathe. His son, the Prince Kushluk, fought valiantly during the whole day, but toward night, finding that all was lost, he fled, taking with him as many of the troops as he could succeed in getting together in the confusion, and at the head of this band made the best of his way into the dominions of one of his uncles, his father's brother, where he hoped to find a temporary shelter until he should have time to determine what was to be done. As for Yamaka, after fighting with desperate fury all day, he was at last, toward night, surrounded and overpowered, and so made prisoner. Temujin ordered his head to be cut off immediately after the battle was over. He considered him not as an honorable and open foe, but rather as a rebel and traitor, and consequently undeserving of any mercy. End of chapter 10「There was now a vast extent of country comprising a very large portion of the interior of the Asiatic continent, and indeed an immense number of wealthy, powerful hordes under Temujin's dominion, and he at once resolved to consolidate his dominion by organizing a regular imperial government over the whole. There were a few more battles to be fought in order to subdue certain khans who still resisted, and some cities to be taken. But these victories were soon obtained, and, in a very short time after the great battle with Tayian, Temujin found himself the undisputed master of what to him was almost the whole known world. All open opposition to his rule had wholly disappeared, and nothing now remained for him to do but to perfect the organization of his army, to enact his code of laws, to determine upon his capital, and to inaugurate generally a system of civil government 
such as is required for the management of the internal affairs of a great empire. Temujin determined upon making Karakorum his capital. He accordingly proceeded to that city at the head of his troops, and entered it in great state. Here he established a very brilliant court, and during all the following winter, while he was occupied with the preliminary arrangements for the organization and consolidation of his empire, there came to him there a continual succession of ambassadors from the various nations and tribes of Central Asia to congratulate him on his victories, and to offer the allegiance or the alliance of the khans which they respectively represented. These ambassadors all came attended by troops of horsemen, splendidly dressed and fully armed, and the gaiety and magnificence of the scenes which were witnessed in Karakorum during the winter surpassed all that had ever been seen there before. In the meantime, while the attention of the masses of the people was occupied and amused by these parades, Temujin was revolving in his mind the form of constitution which he should establish for his empire, and the system of laws by which his people should be governed. He conferred privately with some of his ablest counselors on this subject, and caused a system of government and a code of laws to be drawn up by secretaries. The details of these proposed enactments were discussed in the privy council, and when the whole had been well digested and matured, Temujin, early in the spring, sent out a summons calling upon all the great princes and khans throughout his dominions to assemble at an appointed day, in order that he might lay his proposed system before them. Temujin determined to make his government a sort of elective monarchy. The grand khan was to be chosen by the votes of all the other khans, who were to be assembled in a general convocation for this purpose whenever a new khan was to be installed. Any person who should cause himself to be proclaimed Grand Khan, or who should in any other way attempt to assume the supreme authority without having been duly elected by the other Khans, was to suffer death. The country was divided into provinces, over which of each a subordinate Khan ruled as governor. These governors were, however, to be strictly responsible to the Grand Khan. Whenever summoned by the Grand Khan, they were required to repair at once to the capital, there to render an account of their administration, and to answer any charges which had been made against them. Whenever any serious case of disobedience or maladministration was proved against them, they were to suffer death. Temujin remodeled and reorganized the army on the same or similar principles, the men were divided into companies of about one hundred men each, and every ten of these companies was formed into a regiment, which, of course, contained about a thousand men. The regiments were formed into larger bodies of about ten thousand each. Officers were appointed, of all the various necessary grades, to command these troops, and arrangements were made for having supplies of arms and ammunition provided and stored in magazines under the care of the officers, ready to be distributed to the men whenever they should require. Temujin also made provision for the building of cities and palaces, the making of roads, and the construction of fortifications, by ordaining that all the people should work one day in every week on these public works whenever required. Although the country over which this new government was to be established was now at peace, Temujin was very desirous that the people should not lose the martial spirit which had thus far characterized them. He made laws to encourage and regulate hunting, especially the hunting of wild beasts among the mountains, and subsequently he organized many hunting excursions himself, in connection with the lords of his court and the other great chieftains, in order to awaken an interest in the dangers and excitements of the chase among all the khans. He also often employed bodies of troops in these expeditions, which he considered as a sort of substitute for war. He required that none of the natives of the country should be employed as servants, or allowed to perform any menial duties whatever. For these purposes the people were required to depend on captives taken in war and enslaved. 
One reason why he made this rule was to stimulate the people on the frontiers to make hostile excursions among their neighbors, in order to supply themselves and the country generally with slaves. The right of property in the slaves thus taken was very strictly guarded, and very severe laws were made to enforce it. It was forbidden, on pain of death, to harbor a slave, or give him meat or drink, clothing or shelter, without permission from his master. The penalty was death, too, if a person meeting a fugitive slave neglected to seize and secure him, and deliver him to his master. Every man could marry as many wives as he pleased, and his female slaves were all, by law, entirely at his disposal, to be made concubines. There was one very curious arrangement, which grew out of the great importance which, as we have already seen, was attached to the ties of relationship and family connection among these pastoral nations. Two families could bind themselves together and make themselves legally one, in respect to their connection, by a fictitious marriage arranged between children no longer living. In such a case the contracts were regularly made, just as if the children were still alive, and the ceremonies were all duly performed. After this the two families were held to be legally allied, and they were bound to each other by all the obligations which would have arisen in the case of a real marriage. This custom is said to be continued among some of the Tartar nations to the present day. The people think, it is said, that such a wedding ceremony, duly solemnized by the parents of children who are dead, takes effect upon the subjects of it in the world of spirits, and that thus their union, though arranged and consecrated on earth, is confirmed and consummated in heaven. Besides these peculiar and special enactments, there were the ordinary laws against robbery, theft, murder, adultery, and false witness. The penalties for these offenses were generally severe. The punishment for stealing cattle was death. For petty thefts the criminal was to be beaten with a stick, the number of the blows being proportioned to the nature and aggravation of the offense. He could, however, if he had the means, buy himself off from this punishment by paying nine times the value of the thing stolen. In respect to religion, the constitution which Temujin made declared that there was but one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and it acknowledged him as the supreme ruler and governor of all mankind, the being who alone gives life and death, riches and poverty, who grants and denies whatever he pleases, and exercises over all things an absolute power. This one fundamental article of faith was all that was required. For the rest, Temujin left the various nations and tribes throughout his dominions to adopt such modes of worship and to celebrate such religious rites as they severally preferred, and forbade that any one should be disturbed or molested in any way on account of his religion, whatever form it might assume. At length the time arrived for the grand assembly of the Khans to be convened. The meeting was called, not at Karakorum, the capital, but at a central spot in the interior of the country, called Dilan Ildak. Such a spot was much more convenient than any town or city would have been for the place of meeting, on account of all the great troops of horses and the herds of animals by which the Khans were always accompanied in all their expeditions, and which made it necessary that, whenever any considerable number of them were to be convened, the place chosen should be suitable for a grand encampment, with extensive and fertile pasture-grounds extending all around. As the several Khans came in, each at the head of his own troop of retainers and followers, they severally chose their ground, pitched their tents, and turned their herds of horses, sheep, and oxen out to pasture on the plains. Thus, in the course of a few days, the whole country in every direction became dotted with villages of tents, among which groups of horsemen were now and then to be seen galloping to and fro, and small herds of cattle, each under the care of herdsmen and slaves, moved slowly, cropping the grass as they advanced along the hillsides and through the valleys. At length, when all had assembled, 
a spot was selected in the center of the encampment for the performance of the ceremonies a raised seat was prepared for temujin in a situation suitable to enable him to address the assembly from it before and around this the various khans and their attendants and followers gathered and temujin made them an oration in which he explained the circumstances under which they had come together and announced to them his plans and intentions in respect to the future he stated to them that in consequence of the victories which he had gained through their cooperation and assistance the foundation of a great empire had been laid and that he had now called them together in order that they might join with him in organizing the requisite government for such a dominion and in electing a prince or sovereign to rule over it he called upon them first to proceed to the election of this ruler the khans accordingly proceeded to the election this was in fact only a form for temujin himself was of course to be chosen the election was however made and one of the oldest and most venerable of the khans was commissioned to announce the result he came forward with great solemnity and in the presence of the whole assembly declared that the choice had fallen upon temujin he then made an address to temujin himself who was seated during this part of the ceremony upon a carpet of black felt spread upon the ground in the address the khan reminded temujin that the exalted authority with which he was now invested came from god and that to god he was responsible for the right exercise of his power if he governed his subjects well god he said would render his reign prosperous and happy but if on the other hand he abused his power he would come to a miserable end after the conclusion of the address seven of the khans who had been designated for this purpose came and lifted temujin up and bore him away to a throne which had been set up for him in the midst of the assembly where all the khans and their various bodies of attendants came and offered him their homage among others there came a certain old prophet named Kaksa, who was held in great veneration by all the people on account of his supposed inspiration and the austere life which he led he used to go very thinly clad and with his feet bare summer and winter and it was supposed that his power of enduring the exposures to which he was thus subject was something miraculous and divine he had received accordingly from the people a name which signified the image of god and he was everywhere looked upon as inspired he said moreover that a white horse came to him from time to time and carried him up to heaven where he conversed face to face with god and received the revelations which he was commissioned to make to men all this the people fully believed the man may have been an impostor or he may have been insane oftentimes in such cases the inspiration which the person supposes he is the subject of arises from a certain spiritual exaltation which though it does not wholly unfit him for the ordinary avocations and duties of life still verges upon insanity and often finally lapses into it entirely this old prophet advanced toward temujin while he was seated on his carpet of felt and made a solemn address to him in the hearing of the assembled khans he was charged he said with a message from heaven in respect to the kingdom and dominion of temujin which had been he declared ordained of god and had now been established in fulfillment of the divine will he was commissioned moreover he said to give to temujin the style and title of genghis khan and to declare that his kingdom should not only endure while he lived but should descend to his posterity from generation to generation to the remotest times the people on hearing this address at once adopted the name which the prophet had given to their new ruler and saluted temujin with it in long and loud acclamations it was thus that our hero received the name of genghis khan and soon extended its fame through every part of asia and has since become so greatly renowned through all the world temujin or genghis khan 
as we must now henceforth call him, having thus been proclaimed by the acclamations of the people under the new title with which the old prophet had invested him, sat upon his throne while his subjects came to render him their homage. First the khans themselves came up and kneeled nine times before him, in token of their absolute and complete submission to his authority. After they had retired, the people themselves came and made their obeisance in the same manner. As they rose from their knees after the last prostration, they made the air resound once more with their shouts, crying, Long live great Genghis Khan, in repeated and prolonged acclamations. After this, the new emperor made what might be called his inaugural address. The Khans and their followers gathered once more before his throne, while he delivered an oration to them, in which he thanked them for the honor which they had done him in raising him to the supreme power, and announced to them the principles by which he should be guided in the government of his empire. He promised to be just in his dealings with his subjects, and also to be merciful. He would defend them, he said, against all their enemies. He would do everything in his power to promote their comfort and happiness. He would lead them to honor and glory, and would make their names known throughout the earth. He would deal, impartially too, with all the different tribes and hordes, and would treat the Mongols and the Tartars, the two great classes of his subjects, with equal favor. When the speech was concluded, Genghis Khan distributed presents to all the subordinate Khans, both great and small. He also made magnificent entertainments, which were continued for several days. After thus spending some time in feasting and rejoicings, the Khans, one after another, took their leave of the emperor. The great encampment was broken up, and the different tribes set out on their return to their several homes. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The History of Genghis Khan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott Chapter 12 Dominions of Genghis Khan 1203 after the ceremonies of the inauguration were concluded, Genghis Khan returned, with the officers of his court and his immediate followers, to Karakorum. This town, though nominally the capital of the empire, was, after all, quite an insignificant place. Indeed, but little importance was attached to any villages or towns in those days, and there were very few fixed places of residence that were of any considerable account. The reason is that towns are the seats of commerce and manufactures, and they derive their chief importance from those pursuits, whereas the Mongols and Tartars led almost exclusively a wandering and pastoral life, and all their ideas of wealth and grandeur were associated with great flocks and herds of cattle, and handsome tents, and long trains of wagons loaded with stores of clothing, arms, and other movables, and vast encampments in the neighborhood of rich and extended pasture-grounds. Those who lived permanently in fixed houses they looked down upon as an inferior class, confined to one spot by their poverty or their toil, while they themselves could roam at liberty with their flocks and herds over the plains, riding fleet horses or dromedaries, and encamping where they pleased in the green valleys or on the banks of the meandering streams. Karakorum was accordingly by no means a great and splendid city. It was surrounded by what was called a mud wall, that is, a wall made of blocks of clay dried in the sun. The houses of the inhabitants were mere hovels, and even the palace of the king and all of the other public buildings were of very frail construction for all the architecture of the Mongols in those days took its character from the tent, which was the type and model, so to speak, of all other buildings. The new emperor, however, did not spend a great deal of his time at Karakorum. He was occupied for some years in making excursions at the head of his troops to various parts of his dominions for the purpose of putting down insurrections, 
overawing discontented and insubordinate khans and settling disputes of various kinds arising between the different hordes in these expeditions he was accustomed to move by easy marches across the plains at the head of his army and sometimes would establish himself in a sort of permanent camp where he would remain perhaps as in a fixed residence for weeks or months at a time not only genghis khan himself but many of the other great chieftains were accustomed to live in this manner and one of their encampments if we could have seen it would have been regarded by us as a great curiosity the ground was regularly laid out like a town into quarters squares and streets and the space which it covered was sometimes so large as to extend nearly a mile in each direction the tent of the khan himself was in the center a space was reserved for it there large enough not only for the grand tent itself but also for the rows of smaller tents near for the wives and for other women belonging to the khan's family and also for the rows of carts or wagons containing the stores of provisions the supplies of clothing and arms and the other valuables which these wandering chieftains always took with them in all their peregrinations the tent of the khan in summer was made of a sort of calico and in winter of felt which was much warmer it was raised very high so as to be seen above all the rest of the encampment and it was painted in gay colors and adorned with other barbaric decorations the dwellings in which the women were lodged which were around or near the great tent were sometimes tents and sometimes little huts made of wood when they were of wood they were made very light and were constructed in such a manner that they could be taken to pieces at the shortest notice and packed on carts or wagons in order to be transported to the next place of encampment whenever for any reason it became necessary for their lord and master to remove his domicile to a different ground a large portion of the country which was included within the limits of genghis khan's dominions was fertile ground which produced abundance of grass for the pasturage of the flocks and herds and many springs and streams of water there were however several districts of mountainous country which were the refuge of tigers leopards wolves and other ferocious beasts of prey it was among these mountains that the great hunting parties which genghis khan organized from time to time went in search of their game there was a great officer of the kingdom called the grand huntsman who had the superintendence and charge of everything related to hunting and to game throughout the empire the grand huntsman was an officer of the very highest rank he even took precedence of the first ministers of state genghis khan appointed his son juki who has already been mentioned in connection with the great council of war called by his father and with the battle which was subsequently fought and in which he gained great renown to the office of grand huntsman and at the same time made two of the older and more experienced khans his ministers of state the hunting of wild beasts as ferocious as those that infested the mountains of asia is a very dangerous amusement even at the present day notwithstanding the advantage which the huntsman derives from the use of gunpowder and rifled barrels and fulminating bullets but in those days when the huntsman had no better weapons than bows and arrows javelins and spears the undertaking was dangerous in the extreme an african lion of full size used to be considered as a match for forty men in the days when only ordinary weapons were used against him and it was considered almost hopeless to attack him with less than that number and even with that number to waylay and assail him he was not usually conquered until he had killed or disabled two or three of his foes now however with the terrible artillery invented in modern times a single man if he has the requisite courage coolness and steadiness of nerve is a match for such a lion the weapon used is a double-barreled carabine both barrels being rifled that is provided with spiral grooves within that operate to give the bullets a rotary motion as they issue from the muzzle 
by which they bore their way through the air, as it were, to their destination, with a surprising directness and precision. The bullets discharged by these carabines are not balls, but cylinders, pointed with a cone at the forward end. They are hollow, and are filled with a fulminating composition, which is capable of exploding with a force vastly greater than that of gunpowder. The conical point at the end is made separate from the body of the cylinder, and slides into it by a sort of shank, which, when the bullet strikes the body of the lion or other wild beast, acts like a sort of percussion cap to explode the fulminating powder, and thus the instant that the missile enters the animal's body, it bursts with a terrible explosion, and scatters the iron fragments of the cylinder among his vitals. Thus, while an ordinary musket ball might lodge in his flesh, or even pass entirely through some parts of his body, without producing any other effect than to arouse him to a frenzy, and redouble the force with which he would spring upon his foe, the bursting of one of these fulminating bullets, almost anywhere within his body, brings him down in an instant, and leaves him writhing and rolling upon the ground in the agonies of death. On the Boulevard des Italiens in Paris is the manufactory of de Visma, who makes these carabines for the lion hunters of Algiers. Promenaders, in passing by his windows, stop to look at specimens of these bullets exhibited there. They are of various sizes, adapted to barrels of different bores. Some are entire, others are rent and torn in pieces, having been fired into a bank of earth, that they might burst there as they would do in the body of a wild beast, and then be recovered and preserved to show the effect of the explosion. Even with such terrible weapons as these, it requires at the present day great courage, great coolness, and very extraordinary steadiness of nerve to face a lion or a tiger in his mountain fastness, with any hope of coming off victorious in the contest. But the danger was, of course, infinitely greater in the days of Genghis Khan, when pikes and spears and bows and arrows were the only weapons with which the body of huntsmen could arm themselves for the combat. Indeed, in those days wild beasts were even in some respects more formidable enemies than men. For men, however excited by angry passions, are in some degree under the influence of fear. They will not rush headlong upon absolute and certain destruction, but may be driven back by a mere display of force, if it is obvious that it is a force which they are wholly incapable of resisting. Thus a party of men, however desperate, may be attacked without much danger to the assailants, provided that the force which the assailants bring against them is overwhelming. But it is not so with wild beasts. A lion, a tiger, or a panther, once aroused, is wholly insensible to fear. He will rush headlong upon his foes, however numerous they may be, and however formidably armed. He makes his own destruction sure, it is true, but at the same time he renders almost inevitable the destruction of some one or more of his enemies, and in going out to attack him no one can be sure of not becoming himself one of the victims of his fury. Thus the hunting of wild beasts in the mountains was very dangerous work, and it is not surprising that the office of grand huntsman was one of great consideration and honor. The hunting was, however, not all of the dangerous character above described. Some animals are timid and inoffensive by nature, and attempt to save themselves only by flight. Such animals as these were to be pursued and overtaken by the superior speed of horses and dogs, or to be circumvented by stratagem. There was a species of deer in certain parts of the Mongol country that the huntsmen were accustomed to take in this way, namely, the huntsmen, when they began to draw near to a place where a herd of deer were feeding, would divide themselves into two parties. One party would provide themselves with the antlers of stags, which they arranged in such a manner that they could hold them up over their heads in the thickets, as if real stags were there. 
the others armed with bows and arrows javelins spears and other such weapons would place themselves in ambush near by those who had the antlers would then make a sort of cry imitating that uttered by the hinds the stags of the herd hearing the cry would immediately come toward the spot the men in the thicket then would raise the antlers and move them about so as to deceive the stags and excite their feelings of rivalry and ire while those who were appointed to that office continued to counterfeit the cry of the hind the stags immediately would begin to paw the ground and to prepare for a conflict and then while their attention was thus wholly taken up by the tossing of the false antlers in the thicket the men in ambush would creep up as near as they could take good aim and shoot their poor deluded victims through the heart of course it required a great deal of practice and much skill to perform successfully such feats as these and there were many other branches of the huntsman's art as practiced in those days which could only be acquired by a systematic and special course of training one of the most difficult things was to train the horses so that they would advance to meet tigers and other wild beasts without fear horses have naturally a strong and instinctive terror for such beasts and this terror it was very difficult to overcome the mongol huntsmen however contrived means to inspire the horses with so much courage in this respect that they would advance to the encounter of these terrible foes with as much ardor as a trained charger shows in advancing to meet other horses and horsemen on the field of battle besides the mountainous regions above described there were several deserts in the country of the mongols the greatest of these deserts extends through the very heart of asia and is one of the most extensive districts of barren land in the world unlike most other deserts however the land is very elevated and it is to this elevation that its barrenness is in a great measure due a large part of this desert consists of rocks and barren sands and in the time of which we are writing was totally uninhabitable it was so cold too on account of the great elevation of the land that it was almost impossible to traverse it except in the warmest season of the year other parts of this district which were not so elevated and where the land was not quite so barren produced grass and herbage on which the flocks and herds could feed and thus in certain seasons of the year people resorted to them for pasturage throughout the whole country there were no extensive forests there were a few tangled thickets among the mountains where the wild beasts concealed themselves and made their lairs but this was all one reason why forests did not spring up was as is supposed the custom of the people to burn over the plains every spring as the indians were accustomed to do on the american prairies in the spring the dead grass of the preceding year lay dry and withered and sometimes closely matted together on the ground thus hindering as the people thought the fresh grass from growing up so the people were accustomed on some spring morning when there was a good breeze blowing to set it on fire the fire would run rapidly over the plains burning up everything in its way that was above the ground but the roots of the grass being below were safe from it very soon afterward the new grass would spring up with great luxuriance the people thought that the rich verdure which the new grass displayed and its subsequent rapid growth were owing simply to the fact that the old dead grass was out of the way it is now known however that the burning of the old grass leaves an ash upon the ground which acts powerfully as a fertilizer and that the richness of the fresh vegetation is due in a great measure to this cause such was the country which was inhabited by the wandering pastoral tribes that were now under the sway of genghis khan his dominion had no settled boundaries for it was a dominion over certain tribes rather than over a certain district of country nearly all the tribes composing both the mongol and the tartar nations had now submitted to him though he still had some small wars to wage from time to time with some of the more distant tribes before his authority was fully and finally acknowledged the history of some of these conflicts will be narrated in the next chapter
End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of The History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 13 Adventures of Prince Kushluk, 1203 to 1208. Prince Kushluk as the reader will perhaps recollect, was the son of Tayan, the Khan of the Naimans, who organized the Grand League of Khans against Temujin at the instigation of Yamuka, as related in a preceding chapter. He was the young prince who was opposed to Jughi, the son of Temujin, in the great final battle. The reader will recollect that in that battle Tayan himself was slain, as was also Yamuka, but the young prince succeeded in making his escape. He was accompanied in his flight by a certain general or chieftain named Tukta Bey. This Tukta Bey was the Khan of a powerful tribe. The name of the town or village which he considered his capital was Kashin. It was situated towards the southwest, not far from the borders of China. Tukta Bey, taking Kushluk with him, retreated to this place and there began to make preparations to collect a new army to act against Temujin. I say Temujin, for these circumstances took place immediately after the battle and before Temujin had received his new title of Genghis Khan. Temujin, having learned that Tukta Bey and the young prince had gone to Kashin, determined at once to follow them there. As soon as Tukta Bey heard that he was coming, he began to strengthen the fortifications of his town and to increase the garrison. He also laid in supplies of food and military stores of all kinds. While he was making these preparations, he received the news that Temujin was advancing into his country at the head of an immense force. The force was so large that he was convinced that his town could not long stand out against it. He was greatly perplexed to know what to do. Now it happened that there was a brother of Tayian Khans named Boirak, the chief of a powerful horde that occupied a district of country not very far distant from Tukta Bey's dominions. Tukta Bey thought that this Boirak would be easily induced to aid him in the war as it was a war waged against the mortal enemy of his brother. He determined to leave his capital to be defended by the garrison which he had placed in it and to proceed himself to Boirak's country to obtain reinforcements. He first sent off the prince Kushluk so that he might be as soon as possible in a place of safety. Then, after completing the necessary arrangements and dispositions for the defense of his town, in case it should be attacked during his absence, he took his oldest son, for whose safety he was also greatly concerned, and set out at the head of a small troop of horsemen to go to Boirak. Accordingly, when Temujin, at the head of his forces, arrived at the town of Kashin, he found that the fugitives whom he was pursuing were no longer there. However, he determined to take the town. He accordingly at once invested it and commenced the siege. The garrison made a very determined resistance, but the forces under Temujin's command were too strong for them. The town was soon taken. Temujin ordered his soldiers to slay without mercy all who were found in arms against him within the walls, and the walls themselves, and all other defenses of the place, he caused to be leveled with the ground. He then issued his proclamation, offering peace and pardon to all the rest of the tribe on condition that they would take the oath of allegiance to him. This they readily agreed to do. There were a great many subordinate khans, both of this tribe and of some others that were near, who thus yielded to Temujin and promised to obey him. All this took place, as has already been said, immediately after the great battle with Tayian, and before Temujin had been enthroned as emperor, or had received his new title of Genghis Khan. Indeed, Temujin, while making this expedition to Kashin in pursuit of Kushluk and Tukta Bey, 
had been somewhat uneasy at the loss of time which the campaign occasioned him, as he was anxious to go as soon as possible to Karakorum, in order to take the necessary measures there for arranging and consolidating his government. He accordingly now determined not to pursue the fugitives any farther, but to proceed at once to Karakorum, and postpone all farther operations against Kushluk and Tukta until the next season. So he went to Karakorum, and there, during the course of the winter, formed the constitution of his new empire, and made arrangements for convening a grand assembly of the Khans the next spring, as related in the last chapter. In the meantime, Tukta Bey and the Prince Kushluk were very kindly received by Boyrak, Tayian's brother. For a time, they all had reason to expect that Temujin, after having taken and destroyed Kashin, would continue his pursuit of the prince, and Boyrak began accordingly to make preparations for defense. But when, at length, they learned that Temujin had given up the pursuit and had returned to Karakorum, their apprehensions were, for the moment, relieved. They were, however, well aware that the danger was only postponed, and Boyrak, being determined to defend the cause of his nephew and to avenge, if possible, his brother's death, occupied himself diligently with increasing his army, strengthening his fortifications, and providing himself with all possible means of defense against the attack which he expected would be made upon him in the coming season. Boyrak's expectations of an attack were fully realized. Temujin, after having settled the affairs of his government and having now become Genghis Khan, took the first opportunity in the following season to fit out an expedition against Tukta Bey and Boyrak. He marched into Boyrak's dominions at the head of a strong force. Boyrak came forth to meet him. A great battle was fought. Boyrak was entirely defeated. When he found that the battle was lost, he attempted to fly. He was, however, pursued and taken, and was then brought back to the camp of Genghis Khan, where he was put to death. The conqueror undoubtedly justified this act of cruelty toward his helpless prisoner on the plea that, like Yamaka, he was not an open and honorable foe, but a rebel and traitor, and consequently that the act of putting him to death was the execution of a criminal and not the murder of a prisoner. But although Boyrak himself was thus taken and slain, Kushluk and took to bay succeeded in making their escape. They fled to the northward and westward, scarcely knowing, it would seem, where they were to go. They at last found a place of refuge on the banks of the river Urdish. This river rises not far from the center of the Asiatic continent and flows northward into the northern ocean. The country through which it flows lay to the northwestward of Genghis Khan's dominions and beyond the confines of it. Through this country, Prince Kushluk and Tukta Bey wandered on, accompanied by the small troop of followers that still adhered to them, until they reached a certain fortress called Ardish, where they determined to make a stand. They were among friends here, for Ardish, it seems, was on the confines of territory that belonged to Tukta Bey. The people of the neighborhood immediately flocked to Tukta's standard and thus the fugitive Khan soon found himself at the head of a considerable force. This force was farther increased by the coming in of broken bands that had made their escape from the battle at which Boyrak had been slain at the same time with Tukta Bey, but had become separated from him in their flight. It would seem that, at first, Genghis Khan did not know what was become of the fugitives. At any rate, it was not until the next year that he attempted to pursue them. Then, hearing where they were and what they were doing, he prepared an expedition to penetrate into the country of the Urtish and attack them. It was in the dead of winter when he arrived in the country. He had hurried on at that season of the year in order to prevent Tukta Bey from having time to finish his fortifications. Tukta Bey and those who were with him were amazed when they heard that their enemy was coming at that season of the year. 
the defences which they were preparing for their fortress were not fully completed but they were at once convinced that they could not hold their ground against the body of troops that genghis khan was bringing against them in the open field and so they all took shelter in and near the fortress and awaited their enemy there the winters in that latitude are very cold and the country through which genghis khan had to march was full of difficulty the branches of the river which he had to cross were obstructed with ice and the roads were in many places rendered almost impassable by snow the emperor did not even know the way to the fortress where took to bay and his followers were concealed and it would have been almost impossible for him to find it had it not been for certain tribes through whose territories he passed on the way who furnished him with guides these tribes perceiving how overwhelming was the force which genghis khan commanded knew that it would be useless for them to resist him so they yielded submission to him at once and detached parties of horsemen to go with him down the river to show him the way under the conduct of these guides genghis khan passed on in due time he arrived at the fortress of ardish and immediately forced tukta bey and his allies to come to an engagement tukta's army was very soon defeated and put to flight tukta himself and many other khans and chieftains who had joined him were killed but the prince kushluk was once more fortunate enough to make his escape he fled with a small troop of followers all mounted on fleet horses and after various wanderings in the course of which he and those who were with him endured a great deal of privation and suffering the unhappy fugitive at last reached the dominions of a powerful prince named gurkhan who reigned over a country which is situated in the western part of asia toward the caspian sea and is named turkestan this is the country from which the people called the turks who afterwards spread themselves so widely over the western part of asia and the eastern part of europe originally sprung gurkhan received kushluk and his party in a very friendly manner and genghis khan did not follow them whether he thought that the distance was too great or that the power of gurkhan was too formidable to make it prudent for him to advance into his dominions without a stronger force does not appear at any rate for the time being he gave up the pursuit and after fully securing the fruits of the victory which he had gained at ardish and receiving the submission of all the tribes and khans that inhabited that region of country he set out on his return home it is related that one of the khans who gave in his submission to genghis khan at this time made him a present of a certain bird called a shongar according to a custom often observed among the people of that region the shongar was a very large and fierce bird of prey which however could be trained like the falcons which were so much prized in the middle ages by the princes and nobles of europe it seems it was customary for an inferior khan to present one of these birds to his superior on great occasions as an emblem and token of his submission to his superior's authority the bird in such a case was very richly decorated with gold and precious stones so that the present was sometimes of a very costly and magnificent character genghis khan received such a present as this from a chieftain named ursus inal who was among those that yielded to his sway in the country of the urtish after the battle at which tukta bey was defeated and killed the bird was presented to genghis khan by urus with great ceremony as an act of submission and homage what in the end was the fate of prince kushluk will appear in the next chapter end of chapter 13「
evils of farming the revenue there was another great and powerful khan named Itacut, whose tribe had hitherto been under the dominion of gurkhan the prince of turkestan where kushluk had sought refuge but who about this time revolted from gurkhan and went over to genghis khan under circumstances which illustrate in some degree the peculiar nature of the political ties by which these different tribes and nations were bound to each other it seems that the tribe over which Itacut ruled was tributary to turkestan and that gurkhan had an officer stationed in Itacut's country whose business it was to collect and remit the tribute the name of this collector was shuwakim he was accustomed it seems like almost all tax gatherers in those days to exact more than was his due the system generally adopted by governments in that age of the world for collecting their revenues from tributary or conquered provinces was to farm them as the phrase was that is they sold the whole revenue of a particular district in the gross to some rich man who paid for it a specific sum considerably less of course than the tax itself would really yield and then he reimbursed himself for his outlay and for his trouble by collecting the tax in detail from the people of course it was for the interest of the tax-gatherer in such a case after having paid the round sum to the government to extort as much as possible from the people since all that he obtained over and above the sum that he had paid was his profit on the transaction then if the people complained to the government of his exactions they could seldom obtain any redress for the government knew that if they rebuked or punished the farmer of the revenue or interfered with him in any way they would not be able to make so favorable terms with him for the next year modern system disinterested collectors independent and impartial courts waste of the public money the plan of farming the revenues thus led to a great deal of extortion and oppression which the people were compelled patiently to endure as there was generally no remedy in modern times and among civilized nations this system has been almost universally abandoned the taxes are now always collected for the government directly by officers who have to pay over not a fixed sum but simply what they collect thus the tax gatherers are in some sense impartial since if they collect more than the law entitles them to demand the benefit inures almost wholly to the government they themselves gaining little or no advantage by their extortion besides this there are courts established which are in a great measure independent of the government to which the taxpayer can appeal at once in a case where he thinks he is aggrieved this it is true often puts him to a great deal of trouble and expense but in the end he is pretty sure to have justice done him while under the old system there was ordinarily no remedy at all there was nothing to be done but to appeal to the king or chieftain himself and these complaints seldom received any attention for besides the natural unwillingness of the sovereign to trouble himself about such disputes he had a direct interest in not requiring the extorted money to be paid back or rather in not having it proved that it was extorted thus the poor taxpayer found that the officer who collected the money and the umpire who was to decide in case of disputes were both directly interested against him and he was continually wronged whereas at the present day by means of a system which provides disinterested officers to determine and collect the tax and independent judges to decide all cases of dispute the evils are almost wholly avoided the only difficulty now is the extravagance and waste with which the public money is expended making it necessary to collect a much larger amount than would otherwise be required perhaps some future generation will discover some plain 
and simple remedy for this evil too Shuwakam. the name of the officer who had the general charge of the collection of the taxes in Idikut's territory for gurkhan king of turkestan was as has already been said Shuwakam. he oppressed the people exacting more from them than was really due whether he had farmed the revenue and was thus enriching himself by his extortions or whether he was acting directly in gurkhan's name and made the people pay more than he ought from zeal in his master's service and a desire to recommend himself to favor by sending home to turkestan as large a revenue from the provinces as possible does not appear at all events the people complained bitterly they had however no access to gurkhan shuwakam's master and so they carried their complaints to Idikut, their own khan Idikut's quarrel with gurkhan's tax gatherers Idikut remonstrated with shuwakam but he instead of taking the remonstrance in good part and relaxing the severity of his proceedings resented the interference of Idikut and answered him in a haughty and threatening manner this made Idikut very angry indeed he was angry before as it might naturally be supposed that he would have been at having a person owing allegiance to a foreign prince exercising authority in a proud and domineering manner within his dominions and the reply which shuwakam made when he remonstrated with him on account of his extortions exasperated him beyond all bounds he immediately caused shuwakam to be assassinated he also slew all the other officers of gurkhan within his country those probably who were employed to assist shuwakam in collecting the taxes rebellion he sends to genghis khan the murder of these officers was of course an act of open rebellion against gurkhan and Idikut, in order to shield himself from the consequences of it determined to join himself and his tribe at once to the empire of genghis khan so he immediately dispatched two ambassadors to the mongol emperor with his proposals the envoys accompanied by a suitable troop of guards and attendants went into the mongol country and presently came up with genghis khan while he was on a march toward the country of some tribe or horde that had revolted from him they were very kindly received for although genghis khan was not prepared at present to make open war upon gurkhan or to invade his dominions in pursuit of prince kushluk he was intending to do this at some future day and in the meantime he was very glad to weaken his enemy by drawing off from his empire any tributary tribes that were at all disposed to revolt from him his reception of the embassy he accordingly received the ambassadors of Idikut in a very cordial and friendly manner he readily acceded to the proposals which Idikut made through them and in order to give full proof to Idikut of the readiness and sincerity with which he accepted his proposals he sent back two ambassadors of his own to accompany Idikut's ambassadors on their return and to join them in assuring that prince of the cordiality with which genghis khan accepted his offers of friendship and to promise his protection Idikut's visit to genghis khan Idikut was very much pleased when his messengers returned to learn that his mission had been so successful he immediately determined to go himself and visit genghis khan in his camp in order to confirm the new alliance by making a personal tender to the emperor of his homage and his services he accordingly prepared some splendid presents and placing himself at the head of his troop of guards he proceeded to the camp of genghis khan the emperor received him in a very kind and friendly manner he accepted his presents and in the end was so much pleased with Idikut himself that he gave him one of his daughters in marriage gurkhan in a rage as for gurkhan when he first heard of the murder of shuwakam and the other officers he was in a terrible rage he declared that he would revenge his servant by laying waste Idikut's territories with fire and sword 
but when he heard that Idikut had placed himself under the protection of Genghis Khan, and especially when he learned that he had married the emperor's daughter, he thought it more prudent to postpone his vengeance, not being quite willing to draw upon himself the hostility of so great a power. Subsequent History of Kushluk Jenna Prince Kushluk remained for many years in Turkestan and in the countries adjoining it. He married a daughter of Gurkhan, his protector. Partly in consequence of this connection, and of the high rank which he had held in his own native land, and partly, perhaps, in consequence of his personal courage and other military qualities, he rapidly acquired great influence among the khans of Western Asia, and at last he organized a sort of rebellion against Gurkhan, made war against him, and deprived him of more than half his dominions. He then collected a large army and prepared to make war upon Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan sent one of his best generals at the head of a small but very compact and well-disciplined force against him. The name of this general was Jenna. Kushluk was not at all intimidated by the danger which now threatened him. His own army was much larger than that of Jenna, and he accordingly advanced to meet his enemy without fear. He was, however, beaten in the battle, and when he saw that the day was lost, he fled, followed by a small party of horsemen, who succeeded in saving themselves with him. Kushluk's final defeat and flight, hotly pursued by Jenna. Jenna set out immediately in pursuit of the fugitive, accompanied by a small body of men mounted on the fleetest horses. The party who were with Kushluk, being exhausted by the fatigue of the battle and bewildered by the excitement and terror of their flight, could not keep together, but were overtaken one by one and slain by their pursuers until only three were left. These three kept close to Kushluk and with him went on until Jenna's party lost the track of them. At length, coming to a place where two roads met, Jenna asked a peasant if he had seen any strange horsemen pass that way. The peasant said that four horsemen had passed a short time before, and he told Jenna which road they had taken. Kushluk's death. Jenna and his party rode on in that direction which the peasant had indicated, and pushing forward with redoubled speed, they soon overtook the unhappy fugitives. They fell upon Kushluk without mercy and killed him on the spot. They then cut off his head and turned back to carry it to Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan's Triumph Genghis Khan rewarded Jenna in the most magnificent manner for his successful performance of this exploit, and then, putting Kushluk's head upon a pole, he displayed it in all the camps and villages through which he passed, where it served at once as a token and a trophy of his victory against an enemy, and at the same time as a warning to all other persons of the terrible danger which they would incur in attempting to resist his power. End of chapter 14